for as long as humanity has existed, a war has been waging for power and position. Leaders come and leaders go, but the story stays the same. Promises are made, camps are created, division sets in, and it always ends in a stalemate. But as broken as the world's systems may be, we know that there's no authority except from God. So what does God look for in a leader? What kind of king does God bless? What type of kingdom is he building? Well, once again, welcome to church. My name is Grant. I'm so glad that you're with us. If at the end of the service you need prayer for anything, and there's lots to pray about these days, if you need prayer for anything, our prayer team will be up here across the front. We would love to pray with you. So I said it last week, and I'm going to say it again. If you are an authentic follower of Jesus Christ, you have a king. The prophet Daniel has a vision of Jesus the king, and it reads this way. It says, there before me was one like a son of man, that's Jesus, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence, and he was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never ever be destroyed. If you know that Jesus, you have a king. And because you have a king, everything about you is placed under his authority, including your opinions. Here's what I've noticed in the past days. Everybody has an opinion. And everyone seems to think their opinion is the correct one. Over the years, I've had conversations with people from many different political ideologies, and interestingly enough, they all use the Bible as the basis for their opinion. A friend from the Republican side once said to me, Grant, Ecclesiastes 10, verse 2, the heart of the wise inclines to the right, <laughs> but the heart of the fool to the left, and Jesus was always right, so we should always be right, right, Grant? A friend from the Democrat said, no, come on, come on, come on. Jesus was all about free health care. Like, just read the Bible. He was healing everybody all the time. Just do the math. A friend who's a libertarian quoted the famous verse, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. He said Jesus was anti-establishment, and he was more about freedom and liberty than anyone before in human history. A friend from the Green Party quoted Genesis and said, God gave dominion to mankind over the earth, so stewarding it should be the most important work that we do. Another friend who doesn't actually have an affiliation, said this. He said, Jesus was a conundrum. When it came to the justice that my sin deserved, he was more conservative than the greatest conservative. And when it came to the grace he offered me, he was more liberal than I deserved. All of these people had a deep passion for their perspective. But this was the prevailing sentiment that was underneath of it. It was just like the choice is just so clear. Like, how can the rest of the world be so clueless? They just need to agree with me and everything would be fine. Did you notice that I called them all friends? Because they are. This may be unsettling, but believe it or not, there are people here who love Jesus from all over the political landscape, and you could be sitting beside one of them right now. <laughs> We're doing a series called Kings and Kingdoms, and while we may have very different opinions on earthly issues, there is an agenda at play, and it's not about a political ideology. Without apology, my agenda is for the true, authentic followers of Jesus to pledge their allegiance to their one true king and to conduct themselves under the citizenship of his kingdom because I said it last week and I'll say it again. If you know Jesus, you already have a king. So as we enter into the next couple of weeks, I want to challenge you. The challenge is to seek God in this season in a way that, that may be brand new to you. Here's the challenge. Can you put your faith above your politics? The challenge is not to put your faith alongside of your politics. No, doing that makes them equal. And Jesus was very clear that a follower of Christ puts nothing ahead of their relationship with him. So the challenge is to look at everything, including your ideology through the lens of a biblical worldview, 
and to see the process and the policies and the people who make the process and the policies in the same way that Jesus sees them as people. This week, we're going to look at two more kings from the Old Testament. We're going to put them side by side and see what God has to say about their lives and about ours. The Bible says this in 2 Chronicles 25. Amaziah was 25 years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Jehoadan, and she was from Jerusalem. Don't miss this next sentence. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but not wholeheartedly. Did you hear that? He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but not wholeheartedly. If Amaziah was not wholehearted in his pursuit of God, it means he wasn't giving God his all. As we learned last week, anything less than wholehearted belief says to King Jesus, I just want you to stay out of certain areas of my life because I actually want to rule and reign those particular areas. Those areas are always places of compromise and apathy, and they're ultimately defined by an attitude of, I just don't care. Just like we did last week, before we judge someone else, we need to do an honest evaluation of our own wholeheartedness. So I'd like to invite you to ask the tough questions of yourself that I've been asking myself over the last seven days. In what areas of your life are you compromising? Where have you chosen apathy instead of engagement? Have you made a decision because in your estimation the world is beyond salvage that you're just going to choose to not care? Are you passionate about Jesus and I mean sold out for him or are you doing some good things in the eyes of the Lord but only half-heartedly? The Bible says in Luke chapter 10, Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength, and all of your mind. Psalm 123, or 103, 1 and 2, but with my whole heart and my whole life, with my innermost being, I bow in wonder and love before you, the holy God. Psalm 86, verse 11, teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness and give me an undivided heart. Loving God with your whole heart, it means you choose God's conviction over your personal opinion. Wholeheartedly means that you're going to, if you've been treated unjustly and you want to settle the score, that instead of taking matters into your own hands, you're actually going to trust God with his justice. When you react to a Facebook post in anger, loving God wholeheartedly means you're going to stop and pause and respond in love and humility which means you take the all caps key off. (laughs) Loving God is when you see those other long signs and instead of judging and condemning, you remember Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. And you do it because your king told you to. What would happen if we were face to face with an enemy and we chose love instead of hate? Loving God with your whole heart means choosing God's way even when there is a personal cost. Loving God wholeheartedly, it doesn't mean perfection. It means acknowledging your sin and stepping towards God instead of running away. King Jesus wants wholehearted devotion and that's not what Amaziah offered. If you read his whole life, this is what you figure out. Amaziah started off so well, but compromise took him down the wrong path. And that's how compromise works. It's a slow, slippery slope that leads you away from Jesus. If you do read the rest of his story, Amaziah continued living as a king of compromise and apathy, and God did not honor his leadership. Let me introduce you to another king. His name is Manasseh. The Bible says this, Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king. Can you imagine that? 12. And he reigned in Jerusalem 55 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, following the detestable practices of the nations that the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. He rebuilt the high places. Stop there for a second. A reminder from last week. High places were sacred locations 
where the bad king substituted pagan sin rituals of deviant sexuality, greed, murder, and monetary gain. He substituted evil for what was supposed to be a sacred place of worship of the one true God. That's what Manasseh did. He replaced these high places that his father Hezekiah had demolished. He also erected altars to the Baals and made Asherah poles. Just so you know, those were false gods of sexuality and satanic power. And it says he bowed down to all of the starry hosts and worshiped them. He built altars in the temple of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, my name will remain in Jerusalem forever. In both the courts of the temple of the Lord, he built altars to all of the starry hosts. And then heartbreakingly, listen to what comes next. He sacrificed his children in the valley, in the fire, in the valley of ben Hinnom. Let's just stop there for a second. A few months after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, I was in a coffee shop. And two young college students walked up to me, two guys, and they had two questions. The first question was, are you Pastor Grant? Kind of wanted to say, no, my name's Bob Marvel. That's kind of what I wanted to say. Um, the second question was this. Why are Christians so obsessed with abortion laws? I invited them to sit with me. I actually thanked them. I said, thank you for asking that question respectfully. That, that took a lot of courage. And then over the next number of minutes, I sat down with these two young men. And this is what I said. I said, so for a Jesus follower, our Bible is the highest authority that we have. And our Bible says that God knits every human being together in their mother's womb and they're fearfully and wonderfully made. So there was a prophet named Jeremiah and, 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 and God said to him, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I said, so we believe life begins at conception. Because that little life can't speak for itself, we take Proverbs 31 8 really seriously because God said, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, ensure justice for those who are being crushed. I said, so we really care about it. When God says these words, now choose life so that you and your children may live, that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice, and hold fast. I said, you, you need to know this actually goes deeper for some of us. I says, it's true. We care about the baby, but we also care about the women who are carrying the baby. <laughs> and we want them to choose life because God authored it. I said, and it goes even further than that. I said, we also care about women who've had an abortion, and we also care about men who paid for an abortion or abdicated their role as a father altogether. And how we care for them is by loving them and bringing them the message of Jesus. We believe there is forgiveness for the past and hope for the future because of Jesus. That conversation, it was short, it was civil, it was respectful, it was honest, and I pray to God it was fruitful. That is the position of the King of Life, King Jesus, and Jesus' followers need to weigh that heavily. Manasseh didn't choose life. And it broke God's heart. And the Bible continues describing Manasseh, and it's not a pretty picture. It says, And he practiced divination and witchcraft, sought omens, and consulted mediums and spiritists. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, arousing his anger. I'll just say it Manasseh was wicked. The path that he was on was blatantly evil, and God was furious. Amaziah's path was different. It was slow and subtle. And they both ended up in a place far from God. But that wasn't the end of Manasseh's story. In verse 10 of 2 Chronicles 33, it says this, the Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they paid no attention. So the Lord brought against them the army commanders of the king of Assyria who took Manasseh prisoner 
put a hook in his nose, <laughs> bound him with bronze shackles, and took him to Babylon. Last week, I made a statement, and it struck a chord with people. When people decide to operate far from God and go their own way, when they put their opinion over his direction, there's an inevitable outcome. You end up in a place of distress and desperation. That's where you end up. The Bible says this about Manasseh. So after he has done all of this evil, here's what happens. It's amazing. And it's such a testimony to the grace and patience of God. It says, in his distress, Manasseh's distress, he sought the favor of the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his ancestors. He comes full circle. And when he prayed to him, the Lord was moved by his entreaty and listened to his plea. So he, being God, brought him back to Jerusalem and to his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord is God. Amen. What a story. Did you see that? The king humbled himself greatly. He'd done a whole bunch of stuff, but then he humbled himself greatly, and God was with him in that moment. This is what I know about humility. If you will not humble yourself, you will be humbled. That's how it works. I also know this. As soon as you think you're humble, you're not. Right? Oh, I'm having such a great day. I just feel so humble. I'm, doing, I'm just such a humble person. No, you're not. Which is why so many of us don't want to work on our own humility. But boy, do we enjoy when God is humbling somebody else. Humility is the opposite of pride. God cares about humility. Here's what the Bible says. Isaiah 66, verse 2. This is the one I esteem. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. God also says this. James chapter 4, verse 6. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Let's make this so personal for us. And one of the greatest passages of Scripture that speaks to us about how to pray, especially in these days, in this season, it says this. If my people, who are called by my name, so under the name of King Jesus, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Can we all agree we want the end of that verse? We want God to heal our land. This is the problem. We want the end, but I'm not sure we all want to participate in the beginning. When God calls us to humble ourselves, seek his face with everything in us. Turn from our wicked ways. It says, if the people of King Jesus who live under his rule, his authority, his name, if G those Jesus people will humble who? themselves. My spiritual family, when was the last time you truly humbled yourself before God? When was the last time you came to him and said, Jesus, I have a confession. I kind of like being my own king. When was the last time you came to him, stated the obvious, repented, and then turned away from your compromise and your apathy? When was the last time you willingly humbled yourself and in authentic authenticity and vulnerability came to someone that you had hurt and said these words, I was wrong. And this is the issue with today, right? When we refuse to humble ourselves and own our own wrong, when we believe that we are just so right and our pride gets in the way, when we think we're fine just on our own, in that moment, we're just not desperate for God anymore. A while ago, I had the honor and the privilege of doing a memorial for a, a Nooksack brother who changed a lot of lives by helping people overcome addiction and choose a path of wholeness and recovery. He was a Jesus guy, and I loved him. He passed away, and a group of us gathered together to honor his influence and his legacy. We came together to mourn our friend. 
As the memorial ended, a Nooksack brother and a Lummy brother actually called me to come down and stand in front of everybody, and I didn't know what was going on. I was a little bit uncomfortable. And they wrapped this blank. You got that? They wrapped this around my shoulders, and I, it's one of my favorite, most cherished possessions. I didn't fully understand it, but my Nooksack brother leaned over and he said, if you're wondering, it means your family. It's your family. He's also a bit of a character, so he leaned into my ear again and he said, and with a name like Fishbook, we're not even gonna have to change it. <laughs> so humbling because our common experience brought us to a place where we were all just desperate for God's comfort and help and his wisdom we needed God's help and being unified in that shared focus you know what happened all of our differences just disappeared we all just needed Jesus humility and our desperate need for God actually brought us together Manasseh had a bad history, but there was a moment when he cried out to God in humility and God answered him. I'm amazed at the number of times in the Old Testament where it says a leader inquired of the Lord or cried out to God for help and wisdom. What were they asking for? They were asking, God, can you make my way clear? I don't know exactly which way to go. So some of you are in a tension point right now. There's a tension point. I've been feeling it all morning. Last weekend, in our comments, I heard people say things. It's just like, I just don't know what to do. I don't feel like I can align myself with the lack of humility on this side of the political spectrum. I don't feel like I can align myself with the lack of conviction on the other side of the spectrum. And, and so I feel like I'm going to have to choose between the lesser of two evils, and I just don't want to be a part of evil at all. And this was the conclusion. He said, I think I'm going to do nothing. Can I say something that came out of World War I and World War II? There's a phrase that I've carried with me for a really, really long time. Evil triumphs when good men and women do nothing. not an option and here's the good news Jesus offers help to all of us the Bible says if any of you lacks wisdom you should ask God who gives generously without finding fault he's not going to judge you and it will be given to you that's the promise of God that's James chapter 1 verse 5 this is how it works. So we start with knowledge. We ask God for human knowledge so that our minds are pure and fixed on the convictions of God and his kingdom. That happens in our mind. And then the knowledge moves down into our heart. I believe that the distance between mind and heart, this is the longest distance in the universe. Because a lot of us have a lot of head knowledge, but until it becomes heart knowledge... It can't actually transform. Knowledge is transformed into understanding. Understanding happens when we know what has become rooted in our heart is wholeheartedly devoted to Jesus. And when understanding is aligned with King Jesus, then it becomes wisdom. Knowledge, understanding, and then wisdom. When understanding becomes wisdom, it's heard in our words and it's seen in our actions. And the beautiful thing is that when godly wisdom is present, the only agenda that makes itself known is the pure agenda and the gracious heart of your king. Listen to this description of heavenly wisdom from the book of James. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. 
So, to my spiritual family, my brothers and my sisters, in these days, ask God for supernatural knowledge from the word of God that's internalized into true understanding of God's heart and his conviction that can then flow out in wisdom that can actually transform your world. I'd like to give you 60 seconds in silence to simply ask God, what do you want me to hear? Let's take one minute. Say, God, I know you're speaking. What do you want me to hear? Let's pray together. Father God, knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, would you stand with me? As I close today, just as I did last week, this is my prayer for you, and it's not my words. It comes right out of Ephesians chapter 1. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. That, my friends, is your king. Have a great week. You're dismissed.